Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. Let's pray. Bless the Lord who has caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning. Grant we may in such wise hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that by patience and comfort of thy holy word we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which has given us in our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So, Daniel... Daniel 4, right? Yep. Okay. You want to do some background? Yeah, want, yeah. Well, let, let's, why don't you lead us in? Well, I was going to, I was actually going to invite you. Uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> I, was, I was queuing you up because yeah, you, were, you, yeah. were, you were talking well, about okay. about Napa okay. and Okay, okay. Yeah, so, yeah, so. There, there are issues here about, um, about you know, this, we're going to read this chapter about King having a dream and getting madness and being restored and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, and um, people who study this, scholars, will opine about, you know, well, we've searched the Babylonian records. We never, there's no evidence that Nebuchadnezzar ever had, you know, a seven-year absence or... And but there is a, a letter discovered from a, a, a subsequent Babylonian king named Nabonidus, the letter of Nabonidus, which I think was discovered in, in Qumran in a cave, where he says he had a seven year illness. And, and um, so a lot of people say, well, um, this says Nebuchadnezzar the king, but it is really the letter, Na- it really describes the circumstances that in the letter of Nabonidus. Um, maybe you could say a little bit about the genre of why that... Well, so there's two things. First of all, when they say there's no evidence of Babylonian records, it's not as though we've got a room full of file cabinets about the Babylon Empire. You know, it means they've, they've looked at the two half documents and, you know, so that doesn't mean that it didn't, it doesn't mean that it didn't happen uh, and it doesn't mean that it couldn't be Nebuchadnezzar because they didn't find anything. Nonetheless, well, I mean, yeah, it, it is a genre. It is a genre question here too, and and, um, and I will keep stressing that with Daniel that uh, when we when we come across books in the Old Testament, we sometimes hold them to a standard for writings that are just inapplicable to these kinds of writings. You know, not every book should be read the same way, right? We don't read a biography. And when we, we read a mystery novel, there are rules for different kinds of books. And Daniel's a, diff- a very different kind of book. Alter says it's the most peculiar book in the Old Testament. Um, he says it's, it's just, there's nothing quite like it. Um, it would be in the literature before it or after it. Um, and so uh, when we're coming at Daniel, I think one of, the, one of the errors we can fall into is to look at, you know, you have this figure situated in a historical place with other historical figures like Nebuchadnezzar II, this guy who we know historically burned Jerusalem. And what it can do is it can tempt us to start reading it um, without thinking and start reading it like we want to read like a modern history book, right? We want we, we have like a sort of chronicling of the details, and that's just not how this book is, is written to be read. Um, that doesn't mean that it is a it's an un, it's not a, it's a it's a false you know accounting of things. It just means that the manner in which it's accounting for things is, is different from how we might um, otherwise expect historical uh, like a, like a, a sort of an account of of history to take place. But this goes even further than that to be like I've suggested in the in sessions prior that. Um, this book of Daniel is, is, is drawing from a historical reality of the exile, is maybe even drawing from a historical person, Daniel, in that exile. Um, but him and his friends are being cast as sort of like Jewish hero figures in there and, and are being made to like sort of symbolically like like being you know, to, to be symbolic icons of this particular kind of faithfulness in the midst of captivity. Um, and so because of that, we can't read them, we read what these events that are happening to them as a sort of like orderly accounting of the sequence of events that we might expect from a modern history or even from another kind of ancient history like um, like St. Luke does in the Gospel of Luke when he says, oh, Theophilus, I'm going to give you an orderly recounting of these events. Um, uh, and, and it's not quite even that kind of same thing. So when you have figures like Daniel and his friends, the three that you know survived the fiery furnace, or Daniel himself, you're looking at these figures as like they're they're being sort of emblems of a particular ideal, like a heroic ideal. 
how to be heroically faithful in the midst of captivity. Um, that doesn't mean that they weren't historical figures, um, uh, but that doesn't mean that we're reading this as though it's just a history book. Um, on another level, too, you look at Nebuchadnezzar the same way. Nebuchadnezzar is notorious, becomes notorious as the, you know, the king of Babylon who burns Jerusalem right, and, and burns the thing down. He's a destroyer of the city of God. And, because, and one of the things that you get to be when you're that guy is you get to sort of be the like focus point of everything that stands in opposition to Israel, right? In a similar way how Egypt sort of is stands as this sort of icon of, of oppression in the in, in, in sort of Jewish imagination and it looms large for a, for a long time after you know, the deliverance from Egypt and entering into the promised land. So the captivity in Babylon and the figures who, who perpetuate who who uh, perpetrated the captivity they become sort of these iconic figures that loom large in these sort of different types of storytelling. Nebuchadnezzar did a bunch of historically bad things, and I mean, he's it, there. There are records of like the, the sort of uh, not so pleasant things that he did when he was conquering other people groups. But at the same time, like it, when it, in terms of him being part of this saga of Daniel, he's going to take on um, traits, characteristics, and even like storylines that may not have been biographical to him, but nevertheless represent are, are true of whatever he represents. He being the great enemy of the people of God, what we're seeing happen to him, what we see him doing, those are things that are true of the opponents of, of God's people, even if they weren't true of the biography of Nebuchadnezzar himself. So that's part of the rules of reading Daniel, is we got to look at figures not just as their historical, the historical person they might have been, but also what do they represent in this saga of God's people versus their enemies. And so that helps us to read this a little bit better. Yeah, frees us up to consider it. Any questions about that? I have a question. Yeah. So would you say then, if what I'm hearing you say, in responding to the questions of kind of the historicity of Daniel and these three, the answer is almost it doesn't make a difference. No, I, I do think it makes a difference, um, especially as a, as a Christian reading. And I think um, Christians have a special uh, attentiveness to the historicity of things because of our uh, assertion that um, God works through history among particular people uh, in, in actual sequences of events. I'm not, I, don't, I don't want to say that history is unimportant. I'm saying that for the particular book of Daniel, if not everything that is recorded here is historical, um, that for Daniel, the book of Daniel, it's not the biggest concern. I think for other books, it's a much, much, much greater concern. But I think for, if, if, for I think for Daniel, if we read it in this sort of genre of like a sort of uh, Jewish heroic um, saga, um, there there can be a sort of amplification of certain details, or maybe even the importing of things that happened to other Babylonian kings to Nebuchadnezzar. Um, that, that are appropriate within that genre that may not be appropriate to the genre of like a hist an ancient history that's being written. Um, and I, would, I would say that I'm not, I'm not persuaded that Daniel, the book of Daniel is written as like an ancient history. I think it's written as like a, an ancient, her like a, a heroic post-captivity, like, a, like a, a heroic saga, like almost like, a, like there's a, it's more concerned with inspiring faithfulness through exile than it is concerned with laying out an orderly sequence of events. I think that's that's how I would say. It. So, and then I would sort of restrain my comment there to the Book of Daniel um, and say that. Um, but to, to 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 get more directly at the question and not be oblique about it, um, I, do, I do think that um, the historical um, dimension of the you know of, of of the scriptures is highly significant for Christians um, because we attest that God does um, work in time with particular people in a. Uh, in, in a history that is um, that can be corroborated with other accountings of that history too, and and that um, that even like in this case it's it's you know the the, the corroborating evidence is you know, spotty um, as we as we've mentioned, but but it doesn't make it unimportant. It just makes it um, not problematic for the Book of Daniel. I think. It, it, yeah. Doesn't it also actually not make it false? It, I, I've been reading a little bit about probability. Um, some of those Taleb books. Um, mm -hmm. And the absence, I mean, it's, it's going to sound pedantic, and you wouldn't want to get into a thing where you were constantly saying, oh, well, they just haven't found it yet. But the point is, the, 
that specifically to the objection, there's no evidence that, yeah. but the absence of evidence is not, the absence of the evidence of something is not positive evidence that that something is false. Sure. It just, it it's only that, like, there's no evidence that I'm going to die because I haven't done it yet, right? Um, but I'm going to, right? And we know that. And, and it, it gets into stuff that I there's haven't a, figured out yet, but... There's a, pers- there's, a, there's a type of sort of reasoning that get, that allows us to, to sort of tell a likely story about the world in which relationships between things um, are narrated in a way that um, in a way that renders them plausible and that, that is a legitimate form of reasoning through things. Like right? alliteration in yeah. speech. Wow, that sounds true, you know? Yeah. <laughs> or something I mean it, but not finding it doesn't specifically make that point. Yeah. Yeah. It, it really comes down to what point is, is the thing trying to make, right? So is Daniel trying to lay out a chronicle of a particular person in Babylon or is it is that its main concern, or is it written more um, in the old sense of the word mythically to inspire fidelity among exiles and captivity, um, and may may not be a, a precise chronicling of events? Um, yeah, maybe. I think that there's compelling evidence for that, um, and I don't think it complicates the meaningfulness of the book and its place in the Old Testament, but. I think you're right. I think Daniel. You, one way you could look at Daniel, and, and I think that this is a, this is a persuasive way of looking at Daniel is is looking at it as a um, as a sort of uh, as that second kind of thing, not not a, not not being as concerned with a sort of forensic sequencing of things, um, and uh, more concerned with highlighting uh, heroic um, narrations of, of faithfulness in the face of a of, a, of what seems to be an insurmountable opponent. Yeah. And watching um, the implausibility of that of that faithful resistance to power be victorious over that power. Like that seems to be the main point. Which is well, it's kind of a true story. Right. Even at that particular point. Right. Is it so true? what it does is it tells us it tells us the, the true nature of reality. Even if the precise, like biographical details here are maybe amplified uh, for the sake of narrative, yeah. So it's still it's a it's what Lewis would call a, tr- a true myth. Yeah, it's yeah. a big problem that people now use myth to mean lines. Yeah, of exactly. The like collected false. stories of a race or something like that. Yeah. Wait. Can we? Yeah, I don't know about all of you, but usually in discussions with people who come. Educated people who come at the scripture as a group of kind of news, wise people. Sure. We've got to be able to differentiate between Homer yeah. <laughs> and just every aspect of the Iliad and the Odyssey and the historical group. And sure. Well, some of those characters did exist. We, hey. you know, we got to, we got, you know, we got to, got to, the inerrancy of scripture doesn't, as you observe, does not necessarily mean the iner- inerrancy of every day. Well, it also it, 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 it doesn't yeah. it doesn't, disres- it doesn't disregard genre either. You know, right. like, poetry and uh, yeah. I also want to just just jump in and say that inerrancy as such is really not an Anglican doctrine. You won't find anywhere it talks about the ins- ins- inspired by God, but inerrancy was a sort of fundamentalist conundrum they got themselves in the 20th century. And then I still remember you, as you get a theology, you know, that talks about inerrancy, and you find out, well, there's actually 10 definitions of inerrancy. Yeah. So it's, not, it's like, it's not that. In other words, even say it's inerrant doesn't solve the problem. Then you've got ten sub definitions of what it may mean, and I think I think part of what what Hayden is getting at, and I think is that these the various books of the Bible were written in periods of time, where, and, and they they are literature that communicates what it communicates often through you know through the way literature is written in that time and we get into a lot of misunderstanding when we try to take modern rationalist uh, thinking and and transport that back into these texts uh, perhaps the, the the chief way of course is with Genesis where people try to make it a a, a way to understand how old the world is or something like that 
Um, so anyway, that, I think that's the main thing to look at here. Yeah. And so to get us back to the text, we can actually look at it. Because one, one, of the, one of the problems, especially when you get into who wrote it, did it happen? You know, there are commentaries. There's one commentary I really like. <laughs> but when he actually gets to come to you know, the text, so 100 pages of introduction of who could have written, could right. not have written it, and why thinks this verse belongs there. It's like, okay, well, here we are. And, and a lot of that, um, a lot of that, higher criticism which tended to pull the text apart and say why well, this couldn't happen didn't happen you know got replaced with more um, literary criticism where it realized well this is the text we have right. and when we analyze the text we have we realize it's pretty good there's one guy who said you know they spent a generation trying to unscramble the omelet and we discovered it's a pretty good omelet yeah. <laughs> um, and so at the end of the day, we, we, we want to jump in and see what is this saying to us? This is speaking now, Israel is in exile, and we have to understand how disruptive that was to a national history that, that uh, yeah. experienced an exodus, went to, went to Mount Sinai, got a covenant with God, went to the promised land, got all these promises that this exile is now the complete undoing of all those promises and Israel finds itself living in a foreign country under foreign power and a lot of what we've seen in Daniel so far is is that God's sovereignty and faithfulness and presence has not gone away even there. Now that's a message that really speaks I think to our time especially to um, greatest generation and immediate you know forebearers or, 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 or children um, who lived in a, you know, a more transcendent Western Christendom and now see ourselves in a kind of post-Christian strange world. What, what does this mean? And so there's a text here, I think, so for us to see that, that God is not absent. God has not Jesus has not ceased to be Lord. That Lordship may manifest itself in different ways. And one thing that says here is that, I mean, this is a, one thing we're going to learn here is that, you know, kings that exalt themselves against God and his law are going to be, you know, there's going to be, he puts down the mighty from their seat and he exalts the humble and meek. And so those are the kind of things we'll look at. Those are scriptural word of God lessons that are embedded here. And if we, well, he didn't do it. He didn't do it. You know, if we get too much into to that we're missing the story. So let's read the story. Chapter 4, verse 1. Nebuchadnezzar the king, to all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. Now it's interesting here, he's broadcasting a letter, which is he's making a decree to all people, which you know, and this is the most powerful, you know, king on earth, pagan king. So just bear that in mind as we read down through and see what he has to say. I thought it good to declare the signs and wonders that the Most High God has worked for me. How great are his signs, how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is everlasting kingdom, and his dominion is from generation to generation. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest in my house and flourishing in my palace. I saw a dream which made me afraid. The thoughts of my, on my bed and the visions of my head troubled me. Therefore, I issued a decree to bring all the wise men of Babylon before me, that they might make known to me the interpretation of the dream. Then the magicians, the astrologers, the Chaldeans, the soothsayers came in, and I told them the dream, but they did not make known to me its interpretation. What's the difference here between the first dream we encountered in Daniel? He didn't, he didn't tell them the dream. He was a little angrier then. Here's, we already have a little more humble approach. <laughs> But at last Daniel came before me, his name is Belteshazzar, according to the name of my God, and in him is the spirit of the holy God. And I told the dream before him, saying, Belteshazzar, chief of the magicians, which seems to be a general 
term for these kinds of wise men. Because I know that the spirit of the holy God is in you and no secret troubles you, explain to me the visions of my dream that I have seen and its interpretation. These were the visions of my head while on my bed. I was looking and behold a tree in the midst of the earth and its height was great. The tree grew and became strong. Its height reached to the heavens and it could be seen to the ends of all the earth. Its leaves were lovely, its fruit abundant, and in it was food for all. The beasts of the field found shade under it, the birds of the heaven dwelt in its branches, and all flesh was fed from it. I saw in the visions of my head while on my bed, and there was a watcher, a holy one, coming down from heaven. Interesting. So, something there. So, um... There's a tree. How tall is the tree? But the watcher, where does he have to travel to get to the tree? Down. 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 Does it does it make us think of anything else? Another Bible story, maybe from the Old Testament, from Genesis, related to Babylon, Tower of Babel. Maybe. <laughs> when they're building the Power, what did they try to build it to reach the heavens? And then God came down to take a look at it. So it, you have a little bit of that imagery here that, that this big, strong tree, which, which is going to be Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom, is still high to the heavens, but the angels still have to come down to see it, to watch of the holy ones. Where do we get these? What are we familiar for these words, watchers and holy ones? Watchers and holy ones. Yeah, it's the hymn, right? It's 599, <laughs> watchers and holy ones, which is based on biblical account of the angels. He cried aloud and said thus, Chop down the tree and cut off its branches, strip off its leaves and scatter its fruit. Let the beasts get out from under it and the birds from its branches. Nevertheless, leave the stump and roots in the ground, bound with a band of iron and bronze and the tender grass of the field. Let it be wet with the dew of heaven, and let him graze with the beasts on the grass of the earth. Let his heart be changed from that of a man. Let him be given the heart of a beast, and let seven times pass over him. This decision is by decree of the watchers and the sentence by the word of the holy ones, in order that the living may know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men, gives it to every will, and sets it over the lowest of men. This dream I, King Nebuchadnezzar, have seen. Now you, Belteshazzar, clear its interpretation, since all the wise men of my kingdom are not able to make known to me the interpretation. But you are able for the spirit of the holy God is in you. Now, what's that? What did it mean when it said the seven times? I think it means seven years of euphemism. Oh. Figure speech. Um. Then Daniel, whose name is Belteshazzar, was astonished for a time, and his thoughts troubled him. So the king spoke and said, Belteshazzar, do not let the dreamer's interpretation trouble you. Belteshazzar answered and said, My lord, may the dream concern those who hate you, and his interpretation concern your enemies. The tree that you saw, which grew and became strong, whose height reached to the heavens, and which could be seen by all the earth, whose leaves were lovely and its fruit abundant, which was food for all under the beasts of the all under which the beasts of the field dwell, and whose branches the birds of the heaven had their home. It is you, O King, who have grown and become strong, for your greatness has grown and reaches to the heavens, and your dominion to the end of the earth. And as much as the king saw a watch or a holy one coming down from heaven, saying, Chop down the tree and destroy it, but leave its stump and roots in the earth, bound with a band of iron and bronze in the tender grass of the field. Let it be wet with the dew of heaven. Let him graze with the beasts of the field till seven times pass over him. This is the interpretation, O king. And this is the decree of the Most High, which has come upon my lord the king. 
They shall drive you from men. Your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make you eat grass like oxen. They shall be wet, wet with the dew of heaven. Seven times shall pass over you, till you know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whoever he chooses. And as much as they gave the command to leave the stump and roots of the tree, your kingdom shall be assured to you after you come to know that heaven rules. Therefore, O king, let my advice be acceptable to you. Break off your sins by being righteous and your iniquities by showing mercy to the poor. Perhaps there be a lengthening of your prosperity. Um, so, what 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 are we to make of this? Um, the, the verse twenty seven makes it clear that the arrogance and pride of Nebuchadnezzar, the, the, the tree, uh, is, is defined by injustice. And injustice particularly to who? The poor. So break off your sins by being righteous and your iniquities by showing mercy to the poor. Um, one of the things, of course, in the, um, in the Torah, when it begins regulating economic activity, it provides all kinds of boundaries that limit the amount that the marginalized can be oppressed. And um, this suggests that Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom has um, that he has that he has been he has been unrighteous in his rule by taking advantage of the poor. Aiden, you got some more stuff to add to that? Okay. Yes, that's it. Um, so, and, and the, um, brevity of the message suggests that the receiver would kind of know. It's, it's one of the things, too, I mean, we can digress a little bit on, on rule here. You know, one thing we pray for, the punishment of wickedness and bias, the maintenance of true religion and virtue. Um, one of the things that we, we um, biblically want from rulers is justice because that protects, the, that protects the poor and vulnerable. The more it breaks down, the more the marginal... Um, uh, and, and we know, I mean, probably just as a, an experience, most who have had at some minor level, if you have a, a justice issue in our culture, one of the problems that makes, that, that, that skews justice is um, the more resources you have, the more justice you can get. Mm -hmm. Let's say you have a, yeah. a problem, someone does something, well, you can go to court and you realize it costs you five times as much to pay the lawyer as it is to get what you need, so forget about it. But, um, but so those are the kind of things that can happen when, when, uh, is, when, when, um, there's, there's a, there's a sort of disconcerting, I think, I think on its face, a disconcerting reality being expressed here, though, that God, um, God does, you know, governs through earthly authorities. You know, like He appoints them, even right. though they are sort of flawed images of perfect justice, His own justice, which is reflected in the Torah. You know, Nebuchadnezzar is a far cry from adherence, you know, covenant adherence to, you know, to God's standard of justice, right? But at the same time, He is still the appointed king. Um, to to carry out this season of Israel's history too, right? Well, um, that's a that's a complicated thought uh, to to know what to do with um, because I like to you know the, the purity of God reigning over everything sovereignly is okay. I can get on board with that, right? But then like the the imperfection of of earthly authorities, like I can definitely understand and see that. Um, but understanding how those things they sort of operate in 
they operate together is that's that's a harder thing to reconcile. I mean, do you have a comment on that? Well, I think it, it suggests that that um, as this story suggests that all governments will ultimately be judged by these standards of justice, right. and that. Um, Yeah. So, and the, and that God is in control of it, and God will do that in His good time. And this this one of these things the story consistently shows is the intervention of God. You know, in a in a pagan kingdom, where people have no power other than the power of faithfulness and prayer. And that's something that pertains to that kind of time when when you know is is. is um, as we as we as we suggested in Revelation, that's a great deal of power. Right. But and that, I think Daniel's saying somewhat the same thing. And in a certain sense here, though the story presents Daniel, a subject, exiled Israelite, who was taken forcibly into Babylon um, and made to serve the, the, the king is in a certain sense coming as a messenger, as his sort of judge, as it were. Here's the sentence I'm interpreting for you that as, as, as a faithful servant of God. Um, so some of that, some of that, um, some of those themes are kind of present there. Anything else anyone sees? Questions? I think I think it's worth noting, like in terms of the stuff going on in the literature around this time, and then in the in the region, like the image of the tree is a deeply symbolic um, object, especially in the ancient Near Eastern uh, literature. This idea that like the tree is this emblem of like the provision of the creation, but also it, t- it tends to be associated with like kings particularly, except for there to be a tree that reaches to the heaven that you can see from wherever the earth you are, suggests that this is like an image of this like cosmic tree, this great myth of, you know, uh, this, this myth of power, basic power and provision. Um, and, and, and I think that it, it's significant that um, you have this, this what's, what, it is, what the imagination of everybody who would be listening to this would see is this, you know, this immovable object, right? This great, you know, unthinkably large tree, um, which would represent a power that had been unimaginable to that point, right? Um, this concentration of all this uh, of all this authority, um, to have it just sort of summarily cut down um, would have, would was a reversal of what you would expect in this dream to go, for it to be just suddenly like capsized and, and bound. Um, like that's a, that's, a, that's an irony that I think we miss if we miss out on that symbolic meaning of the tree, right? For it to be just you know sort of locked off um, and to, to kind of just sit there as a stump is a kind of there, there's a sort of dark humor to it um, that we kind of miss out on otherwise. But that's 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 what sort of uh, troubling. I mean, there's one of the dimensions of it that's really like freaking everybody out is there's this suddenness to the reversal of what this thing seems to be um, that no one could see coming, right? And so that's, I think that's that's what's feeding the tension of the moment that makes Nebuchadnezzar so desperate to find the meaning of this thing. Like this isn't supposed to happen to the great tree. Um, the stump is preserved. That's what's right. right. It, it's interesting also as stump preserved, it, it, it's the same image in Isaiah of um, the Messiah. Uh, when Isaiah has his call to ministry, you know, you know, who, who will go, I'll go. Uh, and what, what should, you know, what am I supposed to say? Until, you know, until cities are laid waste without inhabitants, the house is without a man, the land is utterly desolate. Lord has removed men far away and forsaken places are many in the midst of the land, but yet a tenth will be in it, will turn to be for consuming as a terebinth tree or as an oak whose stump remains when it is cut down, so the holy seed shall be its stump. <laughs> so it's interesting. Um, I, I've been um, delving into this um, this remnant theology, and, and that kind of partakes of that, where the, the, the larger part is consumed in judgment, but but the remaining remnant is sort of the seed of hope. Um, in uh, 
Isaiah, it, it, we, we always read that against sort of the messianic prophecy of the continuation of the Davidic kingdom in the midst of, of uh, judgment. Um, here, the, the hope is more general, it seems, that, that after the humiliation of the king, his return in humility will, will he will be restored, but the rest of his kingdom is, the, is now to rule in humility and justice. Um, right. There's there's a there's a remnant even for Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar could, yeah. 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 There's enough enough left to yeah. There's enough left to him. There, there will be a, there will be a distinction though in in Daniel clearly between this is a promise to Nebuchadnezzar that after he goes crazy he's going to restore his rule. It's not the promise of an eternal kingdom. We're going to get later in Daniel. Well, the, in the next the, chapter. Yeah, next chapter. Yeah, the, the, next chapter. yeah the kind of a distinction between uh, the, the, the temporary kingdom. So so the difference between the messianic prophecy is the promise of a, of a kind of enduring people. This is, a, this is a similar image, but simply a promise that Nebuchadnezzar will be restored to rule. Yeah. But no, not, no enduring eternal place for Babylon. So, um, verse 28. All this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar at the end of 12 months. He's walking about the royal palace of Babylon. The king spoke, saying, Is this not great Babylon that I have built for a royal dwelling by my mighty power for the honor of my majesty? While the word was still in the king's mouth, a voice fell from heaven. King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken. The kingdom is departed from you. This reminds me that uh, of that passage in Acts where um, Herod is trying to. He's going to execute. He just executed James, and he's going to. Is that the passage you're talking about? Yeah, when he, when he and, and they're all the voice of a god and not a man. And immediately the worms struck him. Right. Yeah. So. Um, there's also resonance here too. I mean, like you, you can't miss the the, the para, like it, especially if you're writing for a Jewish audience of having a king walking on the roof of his house at you know at night um, would have resonance with the the, the David story. Like, yeah. This is before the Great Fall, mm. you know. And really, like if you look at David's kingship, David's kingship, the the, the problems with that kingship begin when he's on when he's on the rooftop at night. Yeah. Well, which incidentally. He's at the rooftop at night where his men are off in battle. Right. David ceases to go to battle with them, has leisure to walk around and stare at the pretty women around the city. Yeah. Trouble befalls him. But again, you have that contrast between the, the, it's the image used for like the Messianic kingdom, but like being sort of appropriated. Uh, at least referred to in this in this imagery for Nebuchadnezzar, you know, so it's familiar, it's familiar icons. Verse thirty-two: They shall drive you from men, and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make you eat grass like oxen, and seven times shall pass over you, until you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men, and gives it to him where he chooses. Now, interesting here. Let's. The Most High rules the kingdom of men. He gives to every chooses that God has always been Lord of everything. That very hour, the word was fulfilled concerning Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from men and ate grass like oxen. His body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hair had grown like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird's claws. We, shouldn't, we should also be mindful of this image of Babylon you saw in Revelation, which was a symbol of, of uh, um, the unfaithful people. Babylon, Babylon the Great has fallen. Um, Babylon is always a symbol of pride in the Bible. Tower of Babel here, and then when the the narrative transfer of Babylon to Israel is, is the is the um, the haughtiness of God's own people that 
and their unfaithfulness that brings them that brings them down. And it's a good thing to note for now because it'll pick up later in Daniel, and we have one of Daniel's visions later on, of the second half of this book, that the kings of the earth will be compared to beasts. Um, and so, like, there is a um, until the kingdom of the son, the one, the son of man comes along, um, which we talked a lot about in Revelation. We'll talk a lot more about again when we get into the latter half of this book. Um, but compared to the king. The, the son of man who receives a kingdom that lasts forever, the one who is in the who is in the form who has a, a form of a human. You have the, the kings preceding him, whose kingdoms are not forever. They are represented as animals um, compared to the human son of man who comes along to rule forever. Uh, so compared to his humanity, there is like a bestiality to the rest of these uh, yeah. the rest of these kings, and that's reflected in Nebuchadnezzar's thing here. So, so sort of a subhumanity, and, right, and subhumanity. we should understand too. In in Hebrew, we don't always see it, but. The son of man is is the um, is the son of Adam because the right word for man is Adam. So, um, sort of the true the the truly human one, which is the one who who truly bears the image of God, versus the subhuman rulers, which we'll talk more about next. Verse 34, at the end of the time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven, my understanding returned to me, and I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. So the seven-year period of humiliation has its effect of, of humiliation, and he now praises God. Now, um, Our chapter began with with Nebuchadnezzar pronouncing the story, letting people know, as it were, bearing witness to the great works of God. So so even in this pagan empire, God's works are being proclaimed. Alter's note on this is that uh, that this whole uh, this letter is, that's put out to the whole kingdom, uh, it takes the form of um, that particular kind of psalm that starts off with like, let me tell you what the what things the Lord has done for me and always ends in a, in a sort of doxology at the end. And it has the same kind of form here, like of, of, of sort of, of something happening and then the Lord intervening. And then at the end, we, we come to the knowledge of God and the fear of the Lord and we praise him. Like there's a, that's a whole like sub type of, of psalm. And that Nebuchadnezzar is sort of being made to echo that in his own letter to his kingdom. And there's also this, this image here that one of the failures of Israel was to be a light to the nations. So they're they're judged because they're unfaithful, not very witness to God to the nations. So now in exile, we see that God is still bearing witness to the nations. He he won't he'll 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 go in some his own terms if his people won't do it for him. But some measure of that witness is being carried by that faithful remnant in Babylon who are still doing the will of God. Yeah. So our vocation. You know, as a, you know, in a, you know, a, a time of, of growing opposition to, to faith is to be witnesses and to trust that God is still present to bear witness to our faithfulness. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion, his kingdom is from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. He does according to his will in the army of heaven and among all the inhabitants of the earth. No one can restrain his hand or say, what have you done? At the same time, my reason returned to me, and for the glory of my kingdom, my honor, and my splendor returned to me. My counselors and nobles resorted to me. I was restored to my kingdom, and excellent majesty was added to me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the King of heaven, all whose works are true, are truth, and his ways justice, and those who walk in pride he is able to put down. (coughs) 
So you have the praise of God in the mouth of the pagan king. The king of the pagan kings, yeah. right? He's the icon of pagan kingship. And this has been a, it's worth noting the repetition here in the, these three chapters, right? End of chapter two, uh, the interpretation of the dream, um, and the, it results in the sort of the sovereignty of God being affirmed and, and extolled. Chapter three, fiery furnace, you know, this, this challenge of faithfulness that results in the like pagan king being like, oh my gosh, like, yeah, your God is God of all. Third time around, chapter four, like, again, we have this, oh, this, this, this drama that results again in the doxology of so and the greatness of the king of heaven and Daniel's God. Um, yeah, so there's like, it's, it's, we, we have that, like we, we talked about, this first four chapters really set up this, uh, the, the faith, the heroic faithfulness of the, of these, um, of these, these um, Jewish exiles and their response to power, how they, how they, how they respond to the power of Babylon and, and that's focused in Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, and, and how once again, through that small faith, through that faithfulness in the midst of this captivity, God is glorified and God is made, and again, God's sovereignty is, 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 is is made evident, is manifested in the midst of this context. That's setting us up to this repetition, um, setting us up for this sort of interesting twist that we're about to turn into chapter five um, with with uh, King Belshazzar. Um, and so, like, we've got this sort of rhythm going, right? We've got this like crisis arises, faithfulness is the answer, and now like Nebuchadnezzar, you know, the king of kings acknowledges God. Same thing. Crisis arises, faithfulness, doxology. Crisis, faithfulness, doxology. Now we're going to come to this new one. It's going to almost play with our expectations as we go into chapter five with King Belshazzar, um, who, who calls calls in for another interpretation, but it goes radically. It turns left instead of right on us. <laughs> Okay. So Belshazzar the king made a great feast for a thousand of his lord and drank wine in the presence of the thousand. Now, th there's some uh, question here about the king name. Um, Belshazzar, who doesn't seem to be in the king list, but seems to be the son of Nabonidus. But there's also some evidence that uh, though he was son, he actually reigned for a number of years while his father was out in battle. So most of the things that are problematic can be smoothed over and understanding that he probably did was thought of as king. Um, yeah. it, the the, the, the um, Problematic thing is the is the phrase in verse two. His father Nebuchadnezzar, who doesn't seem to be really his father, uh, but there's some gymnastics that can be done to smooth that out. Well, I think I think if we come back to that genre thing, it, it, it's it's less it's it doesn't strain us as much um, because you look at him as the um, the sort of next generation of what Nebuchadnezzar represents. If you look at him more in that in that along that line, it, it, it doesn't trouble us as much. The, yeah, uh, like in so, genealogy. Yeah. Certainly, yeah, son, son, descendant to the king, or yeah. son, that could work that way too. So, yeah. anyway, this, the story is great regardless, but we'll throw that piece of introductory information out. So, he made, the king made a great feast for a thousand of his lords and drank wine in the presence of the thousand. While they tasted the wine, Belshazzar gave the command to bring the gold and silver vessels which his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken from the temple, which had been in Jerusalem, that the king and his lords and his wives and his concubines might drink from them. Then they brought the gold vessels that had been taken from the temple of the house of God, which had been in Jerusalem, and the king and his lords, his wives, his concubines drank from them. This guy was Solomon-esque, wives and concubines. <laughs> they drank wine and praised the gods of gold and silver, bronze and iron, wood and stone. 
In the same hour, the fingers of a man's hand appeared and wrote opposite the lampstand on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw a part of the hand that wrote. Then the king's countenance changed and his thoughts troubled him so that the joints of his hip were loosened and his knees knocked against each other. So we've gone from praise the heart. And the king cried aloud to bring in the astrologers, the Chaldeans, the soothsayers. The king spoke, saying to the wise men of Babylon, whoever reads this writing and tells me its interpretation shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around his neck, and he shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. That's a pretty sudden shift of gears, so it, it's a pretty, I mean, but you can only imagine, you know, if you were reveling and saw a hand on the wall writing words that you might, um, yeah, <laughs> you might smite one against another. And all the king's wise men came, but they could not read the writing or make known the king's interpretation. The whole group seems pretty worthless, at least in the Daniel context. They, they never know anything. <laughs> Um, Which again is, is it highlights the shaming of Babylon because like in the in the parlance of the day the Chaldeans were the best of the best when it came to like sagely you know practice and so for them to be continually embarrassed like this is just a way of kind of throwing them under the bus. Um, What's that? Setting it up. For yeah, yeah. They're, they're, they're sort of like this is this is it, it, it's uh, again like it, it's highlighting the wisdom of Daniel that's that's delivered in by, by his God. Um, but it's like it's kind of a common ancient literature uh, trope to like when you have a challenge that arises, a significant challenge arises, you always trot out the like guy who can't do it as a way of <laughs> highlighting the greatness of the hero who comes along and just kind of like kicks him in the curb and does the thing, you know. So the Chaldeans are the whipping boy of this text. It's it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's meant to that guy that very nice and always beats. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Hamilton Burger. <laughs> <laughs> It was a hamburger. That's a purpose, right? <laughs> then King Belshazzar was greatly troubled, and his countenance was changed, and his lords were astonished, and the queen, because of the words of the king, and his, and his lords came to the banquet hall. Interesting. I didn't how the queen relates to his wives and concubines. Is she just sort of here, and there's another tear? <laughs> Uh, that's a wheel. This, uh, they suggest that it's his mom. Okay. Because the, the mother, the queen mother was... The queen mother. Okay, gotcha. So he's, this is the boy in there with, that's good. That's good, yeah. All right. The queen spoke saying, O king, live forever. Do not let your thoughts trouble you, nor let your countenance change. There is a man in your kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy God. And in the days of your father, light and understanding and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods, were found in him. And King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father the king, made him the chief of the magicians, astrologers, Chaldeans, and soothsayers. Now it's interesting, too, there's another motif here that um, this son of the king doesn't know that, forgets what his father knew, and the lesson of humility has been quickly forgotten. Inasmuch as an excellent spirit, knowledge, and understanding, interpreting dreams, solving riddles, and explaining enigmas were found in this Daniel, whom the king named Belteshazzar. And now let Daniel be called, and he will give you the interpretation. Then Daniel was brought in before the king. King spoke and said to Daniel, Are you that Daniel, this one of the captives from Judah, whom my father the king brought from Judah? I have heard of you, that the Spirit of God is in you, and that light and understanding and excellent wisdom are found in you. Now the wise men, the astrologers, have been brought in before me, that they should read this writing and make known to me its interpretation, but they could not give the interpretation of the thing. 
and I've heard of you that you can give interpretations and explain enigmas. Now, if you can read the writing, make known to me the interpretation. You shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around your neck and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. That's more Joseph imagery. Yeah. 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 It's also funny because if we've read ahead, there's not a whole lot of kingdom left. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, there's, there's there's a bunch of little setup foreshadows here, like when she, when the queen mother comes in and addresses it, and says like, "Oh, king, live forever." Yeah. And it's like, and like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. it's like we got a few hours left. Yeah, yeah. Forever's not very long, apparently. Yeah, and now he's he's yeah. I'm gonna make you this. It's like yeah. yeah I'm sorry. Yeah. Yes. You you're not gonna see tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. Danny answered and said before the king, Let your gifts be for yourself and your wards to another, yet I will read the writing to the king and make known to him the interpretation. O king, the Most High God gave Nebuchadnezzar your father a kingdom of majesty, glory, and honor. And because of the majesty that he gave him, all peoples, nations, and languages trembled and feared before him. Whomever he wished, he executed. Whomever he wished, he kept alive. Whomever he wished, he set up and whomever he wished he put down. When his heart was lifted up and his spirit was hardened in pride, he was deposed from his kingly throne and took his glory from him. Then he was driven from the sons of men. His heart was made like the beasts, and his dwelling was with the wild donkeys. They fed him with grass like oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, till he knew that the Most High God rules the kingdom of men and appoints over him every chooses. But you, his son, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, although you knew all this. But you have lifted yourself up against the Lord of heaven. They have brought the vessels of his house before you. And you and your lords and your wives and your concubines have drunk wine from them. And you have praised the gods of silver and gold, bronze and iron, wood and stone, which do not see or hear or know. And the God who holds your breath in his hand and owns your ways, you have not glorified. Then the fingers of the hand were sent from him, and this writing was written. In the inscription that was written, Mene, Mene, Teko, Ufarsin. This is the interpretation of each word. Mene, God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. Tekel, you have been weighed in the balance and found wanting. Perez, your kingdom has been given and divided, and given to the Medes and the Persians. Then Belshazzar gave the command, they clothed Daniel with purple and put a chain of gold around his neck, made a proclamation concerning him that he should be third ruler of the kingdom, which is a curious response. I mean, um, you know, to be, you know, I guess you're happy to know what was said, but most kings don't like the prophet to come and give bad news. Um, was he saying the face, do you think? Because he said that publicly, that's the award, so he, oh, or was he? That seems to be part of it. I can't think of Being strong, yeah. a big man, yeah. go ahead and do what I said. Yeah, do what I did. And, uh, and he was maybe not sober either. <laughs> Yeah, maybe not sober and and um, you know, and maybe happy to know what it meant. I mean, there there is also a continuing theme of dreams like this or visions like this were interpreted with bad news. The, I mean, Nebuchadnezzar accepted the bad the bad thing, and 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 so there there is that thematic continuation. That very night, Belshazzar, king of the Chaldeans, was slain. And Darius the Mede received the kingdom being about 62 years old. So, um, and, and we'll follow in Daniel that um, we had the Babylonian Empire, uh, which succeeded the Assyrian Empire. And then we have the, Me the Medo-Persian Empire, which is being represented here uh, uh, by, by Darius the Mede and uh, 
which will then come Greek and Greece and then Rome, which will figure prominently in the imagery that we'll, we'll get in, and we get to, to the subsequent chapters. Gosh, we're flying through this. Oh. You say something, why not we get to the third no. chapter tonight? Yeah, no, I, I think that there's a, I think that there's, there's in the context of that, when we're moving through the book, it's helpful to see the place in each chapter in there. Um, seeing the reversal uh, that you have, like we, we looked at those three chapters concerning Nebuchadnezzar, um, and Daniel and his friends. And there's a sort of book ending of that you have an interpretation, and you have like the whole golden statue fiery furnace thing, you have another interpretation, you have this sort of humility that develops. There's a, there's an interesting question I think to ask is like what like why does Nebuchadnezzar keep getting all these sort of like so, this cycle of like kind of exalting himself and you know then coming around to fearing God, whereas Belshazzar, you know, he's he's sort of he's presented as getting like having this one bad like this sort of one bad, <laughs> yeah, yeah. and he's like and like yeah. Babylon is gone yeah. the next day, you know, and, and, and the next thing. I, I don't know. I think that's an interesting question. That's a question I always have when I get to this point in the book. Yeah, there's no, I mean, there's no sort of repentance for Belshazzar. He's sort of summarily judged and destroyed. Well, it, I mean, I suppose in, in the in the logic of the success of stories that, you know, that, that God has made himself known and, and now it should be, the, the royal line should know. You should learn from your Yeah, dad. you should yeah. learn. So so not having integrated that, it's, it's um, um, there's also this sort of, you know, macro political reality of the Medes and the Persians just being stronger now for, right. for whatever reason. Um, yeah. I don't know, there's also seems to be like something in the, the whole, the elaborate um, trotting out of the, uh, the temple um, stuff, you know, yeah. the, 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 the vessels of the temple and them being used as libations to not God. Um, that, that's unique. And they, they, the, the author takes pains to sort of paint out how those are brought forth, they're ordered, then they're brought then they're used, and it's not it's not a quick note. It's a it's a sort of a uh, pause in the in the story to, to go through what's going on here. And I always wonder if that's not that's not meant to like amplify the problem with Belshazzar compared to Nebuchadnezzar, because Nebuchadnezzar is not painted in that in particularly in using no no in in, that, yeah. in, uh, in, per, in perpetrating sacrilege against Jewish religion as much, and um, not at least not directly in the, as directly as this seems to be. That seems to be the only difference. Like a Kind of pull up. Well, this does have a kind of spoiled kid genre to it. You know, the queen mother's not even in the room. Right. You know, she she sends in there. Um, so yeah, it it, it has it has that ir- irresponsible party aspect to it. Um, well, he, he has a warning too. Like if, if you saw your father, whoever that was, he was a donkey or whatever he was for seven years. <laughs> that's a pretty big like. Maybe take heed. Right. Don't go this way. And that that seems that seems to sort of create a bit of irony in the story. We want people to behave like asses for way longer than that, and still do it. It's true. Yeah. <laughs> and it might it might reflect a tendency, you know, a tendency like and again, this whole thing is painting out, you know, this 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 in, this empire right that has toppled Jerusalem and. You know, it, it, and it becomes this icon of, of worldly power, and it's almost—I almost wonder if it's not painting out a tendency of worldly power that, even though it has case study after case study after case study of why vaunting themselves is, is not a good idea, um, and reveling in that vaunting is not a good idea, it, it almost like, can't but help do it. So they had to—they had to be somewhat like that in order to keep conquering everything. Right, right. So you have Belshazzar, who strikes me as a party boy. Right in the story, because he doesn't have any of the imagery surrounding him of like the like the authority that Nebuchadnezzar seems to have. Nebuchadnezzar is the conqueror. Nebuchadnezzar is the one who is the king of king over kings who crushes kings and brings them into submission and calls everyone into submission. Belshazzar strikes me as like the kind of spoiled yeah the spoiled party kid who like he's not the conqueror. He's the guy who kind of hangs out at home while the guy, while his dad is conquering. And and he, so he sort of grows up in 
the trappings of power without any of the sort of dignity of it or the stature of it. You know, and so you have Nebuchadnezzar who's always put in scenes of ruling his court, right? Daniel, Daniel always meets him in the court. Like he's like he's a like, call before me to my throne. You know, but Belshazzar, you only seem to get him with is he's in the middle of a giant party. You know. So Nebuchadnezzar at least has even though he's 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 full of hubris, you have Nebuchadnezzar at least has the stature of a king and seems to act seriously about it. Belshazzar is just—he's having a kegger in his dad's house, you know, and like, and, and then and then amplifies it by dipping into some, some pretty heavy sacrilege. It's like, and then it goes to the point of like mocking him, saying like, took the vessels that his dad had taken from Jerusalem, right? Like, it's nothing that he's he's sort of on a he's sort of like riding a high of a conquest that's not his own. Edward Longshanks' sons break. Right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. The, the unread. <laughs> yeah. Is Nebuchadnezzar dead at this point? Is he? I don't know. It doesn't. It's not clear. The translation it's, says he's a grandson. Absent. Yeah. Belshazzar is the grandson. Yeah. So that's what that's what Bishop is bringing up earlier. Like it's not it's not clear that like he's the direct son of Nebuchadnezzar or descendant. He's he, the he's late. Yeah. He's later on. It depends on how you sort of date the place where where he's coming along. Yeah. Um, my note. Yeah. My notes all say that he's like. He's the he's not the direct son. He's like the son of the guy who took over after Nebuchadnezzar. Um, yeah, and so then Nabonidus. He's Nabonidus' son. That's what my note says. Uh, but yeah, uh, enough to be enough that the legends of Nebuchadnezzar probably should pertain still, like like within living memory. Daniel um, is an old man now. Sorry. Daniel, yeah, Daniel. Yeah, Daniel the, 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 well, the the um, the uh, I think I you know the, the idea is that Daniel lived in Babylon for a long time. He was probably taken as a kid, I suspect. Yeah. The the idea is he was probably in a dis- deportation in the in the six hundreds before the actual destruction of Jerusalem. He probably was taken, and if he was a young man, he probably li- he might have lived in the, I can't remember the exact date, but the five thirties, five forties. So he was there for a while. Um, yeah. So. So well, let's let, we I, let's, let's do one more. Let's let's go. Uh, let's go. Um, let's go get. Let's, let's 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 teach the new guys yeah, some lessons. Sense. The new management. The new management. There are also some issues with the the. The Mede per king list, which I'm not going to get into. We're just going to read it as Darius the Mede right now. <laughs> Unless you have some. Okay, okay. Um, it pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps to be over the whole kingdom. And over these three governors, of whom Daniel was one, that the satraps might give an account to them so the king would suffer no loss. So Daniel retains prominence in the transfer. Um, and of course, we're not giving any account here of any, you know, whatever happened to all the, the previous thing, but simply that Daniel was probably, you know, respected and, and um, anyway, his influence carried over. Then this Daniel distinguished himself above the governors and satraps because an excellent spirit was in him. The king gave thought to setting them over the whole realm. So the governors and satraps sought to find some charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could find no charge or fault because he was faithful, nor was there any error or fault found in him. Now, why do they want to do this? They want to usurp his. They want the power for themselves. Jealousy. And he also does an image of kind of persecution here of of one. Um, so anyway, that, that seems like the, you know, the the base answer is jealousy. Especially if you have a. Um, new regime and Daniel's brought over from the old regime probably to be put amongst those who've been there for a while and he raises up above them there's going to be some of that going on especially if he just conquered yeah. the old guard 
Yeah. That's an unfriendly thing. What's that? Unfriendly thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A, a hostile takeover. Yeah. <laughs> then these men said, "We shall find. We shall not find any charge against this Daniel unless we find it against him concerning the law of his God." So these governors and satraps thronged before the king <laughs> and said to him, "King Darius, live forever." All the governors of the kingdom, the administrators, satraps, the counselors, and advisors have consulted together to establish a royal statute and make it a firm decree. Whoever petitions any god or man for 30 days except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish a decree and sign the writing so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which does not alter. Then King Darius signed the written decree. Now when, the, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home and in his upper room with his window open towards Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before God as was his custom since early days. I want to highlight for you that here is our earliest biblical evidence of the daily office. <laughs> three, I mean, it's funny, but it's actually the case that, that there are three times a day he prays towards Jerusalem. The three times are morning, noon, and night. And um, we get to the Acts of the Apostles and the whole encounter between Cornelius and um, Peter leads the conversion to Gentiles um, or the awareness that Gentiles are going to be okay. Uh, it's precisely that both of them were practitioners of these hours, Six hours yeah. of prayer, and and they were then they were they were they were fixed prayers that that pertain to them. So Daniel's in the habit of praying three times a day like this. Um, they all know that because they know Daniel. So they know that the minute they enact this decree, not only will Daniel not obey it, but they'll, he'll be doing it out his window. <laughs> and uh, they'll be able to say, there, there's that guy. Right, which, which points to his consistency in yeah. the office, right? Yeah, they, yeah. they knew where to find him. Yeah, knew where to find him, him yeah. yeah. Incidentally, in that line, the earliest uh, post-biblical reference to this is the D.K. with the instruction of the Christians to pray the Lord's Prayer three times a day, which is probably the earliest sort of version of the office. And so the earliest version of the daily office was morning, noon, and night. Those expanded out into liturgies with psalms and readings. Then these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. And they went before the king and spoke concerning the king's decree. Have you not signed a decree that every man who petitions any god or man within 30 days, six you, O king, shall be cast in a den of lions? Of course I signed it, because you all made me. Yeah. <laughs> the whole tempter-accuser thing here kind of comes up, too. The king answered and said, The thing is true according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which, which does not alter. So they answered and said before the king, that, that Daniel, who is one of the captives from Judah, does not show due regard for you, O king, before the decree that you have signed, but makes his petition three times a day. And when the king heard these words, he was greatly displeased with himself and set his heart on Daniel to deliver him. And he labored till the going down of the sun to deliver him. So he liked Daniel. He put him up and he just had the OS moment to realize he'd been duped by his other counselors to get rid of the guy he, he likes the most. We always sleep on it. Yeah. Then he's been approached the king and said to the king, you know... O king, that is the law of the Medes and the Persians, that no decree or statute which king establishes may be changed. So the king gave the command, they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. But the king spoke to Daniel, Your God, whom you serve continually, he will deliver you. 
Then a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring, with the signets of his lord, that the purpose concerning Daniel might not be changed. Now, he says, um, your God will deliver you. You wonder if he was not inheritor of some of lore about, you know, some of these things. So he has some understanding about, about the power of Daniel's God. Now, the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting. This is interesting here, and one thing we should know about the Medes and the Persians is that uh, the Persians especially were known to be very favorable to Jews. It was Cyrus the Persian uh, who, subsequent to this regime, very shortly will issue a decree to allow the Jews to return. So we don't we don't see in this story the hostility towards God that was shown by the Babylonian Empire. We, we see the attack on, on Daniel here is the jealousy of the sort of co-administrators, but not, not the hubris of the king. In fact, the king here is presented as someone who's, who's a, in favor of Daniel, and when he's in trouble, actually fasts and prays for him all night. So. Do we know why? Like historically, were the Persians more they were, inclined to religion or something like that? Well, they were, they were, everyone was inclined to religion, uh, but the Persians were known to be more tolerant of, of, of uh, other religions. They didn't well, have as much of a bone to pick about um, exerting superiority of divinities as the Babylonians seem to be. Uh, uh, and, so, and so, like, yeah, there is a, the Cyrus, you know, was, was sort of reputed to be a um, a sort of enlightened secret. Where did the Why wouldn't? Yeah, yeah. 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 So that, so where, that's where some of that, the, the roots of that come come from. It, 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 it's um, and so it didn't, it didn't, it didn't nitpick as much, and it didn't have as much of a, <coughs> it didn't have as much of a kind of conquest of the gods kind of thing going on as, as much as. Yeah, like Zoroaster has an happens. has an echo of monotheism. Yeah, exactly. And, and yeah. some similar themes of morality and judgment that was you know and uh, there's some good books about the convergence of the of the Jews and Persians in that. Either, uh, about the influence of Persia even on Jewish religion, but it wasn't. They were more. They won't overt. They weren't overtly pagan in the same way that, that the, the Babylonians were. Yeah, they were more obviously polytheistic. And, and as, as, as Paul was alluding to, the you know though we love the the, the tradition of uh, the wise men being the three kings. Uh, from from the Orient uh, were probably Persian ambassadors yeah. um, from the from the Persian kingdom, which which endured in the East for a while up to. The, and what would make sense of that is the connection between Judaism and Persian religion established in this that it endured because you would have had some remnants still there. So they might have knowledge of the prophecies to send an ambassador to ask about the birth of the King of the Jews. Is there also a distinction, like the contemporary one, sort of the difference between an authoritarian and a totalitarian, where the totalitarian doesn't uh, sort of want you to do anything that he doesn't want you to do, but the authoritarian doesn't mind what you do as long as you don't do it against him. And the, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like the, there's, there's neither is, is preferable. I don't know that there's a way to broadly characterize the, the empires, um, but. I mean, for what we do know of different of the succession of kings, yeah, there tended to be a sort of different character, a different manner among different kings. And as we got toward the Persian kings, you had um, you had a lightning up, a collective lightning. I think what it seemed to be a collective lightning up, such that by the time you get to Cyrus, um, it's, it's, a, it's an empire-wide actually decree it's not, that affects the Jews, but it's really um, it's sort of trying to walk back a little bit um, the Babylonian um, like. Um, Tactic of exiling people and multiple inter- people, and they, everyone, they, really everyone they conquered, you would, you would just sort of scatter them across your empire and assimilate them as quickly as possible, and not let them, not let them sort of um, collect, you know, and form pockets of resistance to your, to your empire. That was that was a tactic that went all the way back to the Assyrians. The Assyrians, you know, did, 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 were very robust in that as well. That will that will pick it up. Um, afterward, from then, but, then, but the Persians seem to come along and say, like, "Yeah, let's let's pull pull back on that." By the time you get Cyrus, it's like, "Yeah, you can, we can, we can have an empire. You can go back and you know 
build your high holy sites and, and stuff like that. There was a again a sort of a, a, a reputation of being sort of enlightened in that way, having a sort of um, toler- a, a wide tolerance for for varying religions within the empire. Yeah. So King's fasting and didn't sleep. The king rose very early in the morning, went with haste to the den of lions. When he came to the den, he cried out with a lamenting voice to Daniel. The king spoke, saying to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the lions? Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. My God has sent his angel and shut the lion's mouth so that they have not hurt me because I was found innocent before him. And also, O king, I have done no wrong before you. Now the king was exceedingly glad for him and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no injury whatever was found on him because he believed in his God. And the king gave the command, that those that, and they brought those men who would accuse Daniel, and they cast them into the den of lions, them, their children, and their wives. <laughs> Carefully marry. <laughs> and the lions overpowered them and broke all their bones in pieces before they ever came to the bottom of the den. I'm sure I understand that, like in the air. Then King Darius wrote, To all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell on the earth, peace be multiplied. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, men must tremble in fear before the God of Daniel. For he is a living God and steadfast forever. His kingdom is the one which shall not be destroyed, and his dominion shall endure to the end. He delivers and rescues, and he works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth, who has delivered Daniel from the power of lions. So this Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus the Persian. So uh, we'll, 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 we'll stop it there. Um, they're kind of, it's kind of interesting reading Dan, you know, that you, these are long stories, but they're stories that you kind of read through and reflect upon. They're meant, they're meant to be, to again, to express that God is not abandoned to sovereignty, even though the Jews are in exile. And we're also seeing pagan kings successively confess faith in him. But also pagan kings passing away in, su- in accelerating fashion. Like, mm-hmm. So you linger for a while with Nebuchadnezzar over three chapters. Belshazzar comes along, boom, done. Yeah. And you, then you switch it to the then, he, then Darius comes along, then you immediately at the end of his head, like, and then he went, like, and the king beyond Darius, Cyrus, you know, like, it presents, Daniel is the guy who's, who endures the kings, these great kings of the earth, they're the ones who pass away. And, and then we're going to get that in kind of... Um, drawn out a little more into chapter 7. Yeah. I think it's worth noting that the, the style and, of, and concern of this book is about to sort of take a real turn um, because we kind of had this story format up to this point, you know, through chapter 6. When we get into 7, from 7 to 12, it's like a prolonged series of visions um, that's going to be still a lot, very familiar to all of us having just, you know, kind of gone through Revelation. Um, but yeah, so we're, we're kind of changing the game a little bit for next week uh, when we go to chapter 7. That's another indication of the sort of reading that the book requires mm-hmm. we're talking about. I mean, it's a weird there's a book. letter from yeah. Nebuchadnezzar, there's a there's story, yeah. there's, there's hero there's stories, some you know, history, royal letters, yeah. And then you have some real, like, prophetic vision, vision description. Uh, but, but, Dan, but chapter 7, especially next time, um, is where we get the uh, Son of Man coming on a cloud right. vision, which is central to Revelation. So we'll revisit that because I think, um, well, it's very important to a right understanding what you just was saying about these things. Um, so... Lord be with you. Let's pray. Lord, bless us and keep us. Lord, make his face to shine upon us. Be gracious unto us. The Lord, lift up his countenance upon us. Give us peace this night and forevermore. Amen.
Have a good day.